Welcome, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our team at the South Bay WIB for all the support that they've been giving, particularly Laura, uh, who's working away at getting everybody or organized, Chris Cagle, who's our support lead, Jamelli, who will be going around from room to room doing some of our media uh, photography, and a big, big, big thanks of appreciation to Dave Whelan, the executive director for Bioscience LA, who has been just instrumental in helping us put together this panel. So thank you very, very much. Welcome all of our students and our panelists. While track three work experience is not at a facility this year, we're bringing the experts to you. I will be introducing our panelists more fully in a moment. For now, let me tell you who represents which niche within today's expanding careers in biosciences. Um, what careers each will highlight, realizing some may overlap. So in order of appearance and panelists, you'll know what your order is now. Uh, relating to occupations within the world of artificial intelligence, Dr. Jasmine Berry, why don't you just wave so they can see you. For product management, development and bioinformatics, Angel Gonzalez. To unveil occupations on the business entrepreneurial side, including medical devices, Catherine Cooper. In the world of nonprofits and technical writing, technical medical writing, Dr. Allison Rosenzweig. And in the huge arena of biomanufacturing, Garrett Asinuma. Today's format begins with each panelist's five minute overview of careers in their field followed by Laura separating just the students into five rooms where you will stay, do not expect to move. The panelists will be rotating from room to room about every eight minutes or so, answering your questions and helping you learn more about careers in their field of expertise. Afterward, everyone will return to the main room, so expect that, um, and we will go from there. Reminder, please, students, Cameras and mics on during the breakouts, please. However, they may be off and mics muted until then. So let's begin with, um, with starting our panel. And you might wanna make sure you're on speaker view, everybody. So our first panelist is, um, as a research scientist, Dr. Jasmine Berry actively works to model the science of artificial intelligence. Many of us know it as AI. Presently, Dr. Berry is CTO, Chief Technical Officer of Harexe Health, a new virtual e-wellness platform for diabetic patients and consumers, all accomplished via mobile smartphone apps. Jasmine provides subject matter expertise on AI-enabled systems to support such scalable implementation of AI for health-related applications. Some of her past roles, which are numerous in tech, include software engineer at the National Security Agency, intrusion analyst at Lockheed Martin, and quality and reliability engineer at Intel. Received her BS degree in computer science from Norfolk State University, then pursued her master's and PhD in computer science from the University of Southern California. Jasmine, we understand you want to share your screen as well. Um, are we set on that, Laura? Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, okay. Deborah, for the introduction. I greatly appreciate it. My pleasure. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. And uh, let's see. Let's hope this works. Uh, let's see. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes, thank you. Okay, excellent, excellent, perfect. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so like Deborah said, I am Jasmine Berry, and I'm gonna to talk to you uh, very briefly about AI and healthcare and uh, possible career options that you have if you're interested uh, in this particular space. So some of us have heard of AI before, uh, mainly as it relates to things of, of related to robotics. Um, sometimes we, we hear of you know, robots taking over and becoming more smarter or smarter than humans one day. Uh, but just to kind of give a, a real 
idea of what AI is in the modern time. Uh, we define AI very briefly as a wide ranging branch of computer science, which is concerned with building uh, smart systems that are capable of performing tasks that typically require human intelligence. So we look at the human aspect uh, in a lot of ways to model certain behaviors that we can apply to our computational systems, like reasoning, planning, learning, uh, knowledge representation, perception, uh, motion, and manipulation. And we believe by studying uh, the human brain or even the human body, we can figure out ways that we can make our computational systems faster, uh, more durable, and more robust. So uh, as it relates to healthcare, you know, a one of the fears that many people have is that AI will eventually take over uh, the healthcare system and even replace our jobs. So just to kind of get a, a good uh, understanding of, um, of AI, I just want to if you can maybe answer this question in the chat box, if the students can open the chat box and enter uh, the answer to this question or, or what you believe the answer to be. It's how many jobs have been eliminated by AI in healthcare to date? Uh, if you can give me a, a quick answer, what do you think, uh, how many jobs have been eliminated by artificial intelligence? And I'm gonna see if I can open the chat here. Okay, are the answers coming through? Let's see. <laughs> 10K, 50,000. Not quite, maybe one day. Okay, any more answers? 1 million. That's, that's a lot of jobs. Replace 2,000. Okay, so you guys have some very high numbers there. So let me give you the, the actual answer. So the answer is none. To date, as it stands, AI has not replaced any jobs, which can be very surprising. Uh, but uh, I'll give a reason for that probably in the break rooms, we'll discuss this, uh, why this is the case. Now, when it relates to, or when it comes down to potential careers in AI machine learning, uh, if I were your, in your position, uh, one of the things I would want to know is what are the entry level jobs um, in AI and how much you know you could potentially make with the salary. So with AI, uh, some of the top jobs that people are hiring for that you can train yourself uh, for an entry level position include machine learning engineer, uh, data scientists where you're processing information all the time and learning to make meaning out of all of the, all of the data that comes in. Uh, we also have computer vision engineer, which can apply to uh, robotics uh, or smart driving cars or smart cars and data warehouse uh, architect and algorithm engineers. Now for these particular careers, uh, there is a particular pathway that helps to get there. Uh, and it could start right now as soon as you uh, leave this event here today. And you can start the educational requirements that include uh, you know, Bayesian networking, which is working with artificial neural networks, uh, studying computer science, basically learning how to code and program, uh, cognitive science theory, getting into engineering, physics, uh, robotics, and um, some very basic levels of math that you're probably studying now already, which includes algebra, calculus, logic, and probability and statistics. And I have uh, an attached here kind of like a guide to get started with a career in AI. And I'll share that link with you in the breakout rooms uh, to follow. And also, if you are interested in learning more um, into AI, I suggest I'm um, doing a lot of reading regarding the articles, the potential of AI in healthcare, uh, and also watching a variety of videos that show you how to program specifically for uh, building these systems to study diseases, uh, drug discovery, learning how to create new drugs to combat certain illnesses, and uh, also detecting things like skin cancers. So, so these are applications that AI has been applied to across the board, and you can start learning this uh, as soon as today if you're interested in it. And I hope this was a, a very brief overview of what AI can do. So thank you. That's fabulous, Jasmine. Thank you so much. Field of opportunities there. It's a lot new to me, so I'm sure to the students too. Our next speaker will be Angel Gonzalez. Angel is a research scientist with specialties in drug development, building healthcare products using next generation sequencing technologies and bioinformatics. 
He currently is a senior researcher at Zymo Research in Irvine, where he focuses on developing whole genome sequencing pipelines, which enable the study and characterization of the, micro, of the microbial, microbial world. I've got a lot of language to learn. Previously, Angel worked on developing a novel class of antibiotics that target antibiotic resistant bacteria using molecular biology and bioinformatic techniques. Angel is passionate about solving pressing healthcare challenges using genomics and sequencing technology. Born and raised in Los Angeles, he holds a bachelor in biochemistry from Hiram College in Ohio. Like many successful people in their field of interest, Angel knows the value of networking and is actively engaged in Biotech Connection Los Angeles, or BCLA, an organization to promote and support students, researchers, and professionals in the biosciences. Angel, we're gonna turn over the speaker platform to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to share with you just a small part of the science world to you. Um, I work in product management and product development. So what does that really mean in the context of science? Um, uh, overall, at a higher level, uh, my focus is to build products that build, that bring value to people, that solve a pressing need or address a growing problem. Um, and to give you an, uh, a very recent example uh, of a product that I'm currently helping to build at Zymo. Um, we currently uh, are undertaking to build a pipeline to, uh, to understand COVID, uh, co the coronavirus. Um, specifically, the program that we're looking to build is a COVID surveillance program uh, with the objective of detecting different variations of the coronavirus. And so, we asked the question, especially the past uh, year or so, what can we do uh, to help uh, the community, uh, our environment, um, to help uh, this pressing need of understanding this threat of the coronavirus? And so we thought, what can we do? What are the most, how can we use our own specialties to help bring something that will bring value. And so this happened uh, as recent as two weeks ago. Um, and so uh, currently we have built a team composing of many different type of scientists. Scientists that, uh, that specialize in genetic material uh, extraction and purification. Um, we have scientists that focus on specifically working in the lab to help prepare uh, samples for sequencing, mm -hmm. which is over, which is uh, the most simplistic is helping to break down uh, the genetic material of COVID uh, into small bits and pieces that will later be used uh, to kind of stitch back together uh, to help assemble the entire genetic uh, material of the virus. And so mm -hmm. the objective here um, is to understand if the virus is mutating, is it changing, uh, so that other scientists that are looking to build vaccines or therapeutics have a better chance to combat the virus more effectively. Um, and the last type of scientist really that is part of uh, our growing team are bioinformaticians. And bioinformaticians, they don't necessarily work in the lab. Uh, their lab is mostly their computer, and their job is to help analyze the genetic material that uh, of the coronavirus. And they do different types of analysis using statistics, um, mostly to help uh, piece back together the, the, the genetic material from the samples. And at the end of the day, what we end up having is a report that, that is able to detail the the genome which is the entire genetic material of the of the virus and be able to analyze it in such a way to be able to say is this virus the same virus that has been infecting uh, x amount of people or is the virus changing gradually over time and again the goal 
that I have uh, as a product manager, product uh, developer, is to look at every component along the way from the sample extraction to the library uh, preparation for sequencing to the bioinformatics to the reports that the customer, which will either be like a hospital that is interested to see uh, what, their, what type of virus the patient has. And so I ask myself, how can I make this process faster? How can I design this process to go to be more efficient? Um, and from a cost perspective, how can I make this uh, product effective, cost effective for um, that is realistic to put on the market. And so that requires me as a scientist to know every single step of the process very, very well, but at the same time also have a bigger picture from a business perspective, um, how can we uh, maximize uh, the exposure of our product? How can we um, build relationships with with other companies that may be interested in our work, hospitals, cities that are looking to better understand uh, how the virus is spreading. And so putting all this together, it's, it's a really uh, multifaceted uh, job that touches on a little bit of everything. And ultimately that's, that's what keeps me very mm -hmm. excited about uh, um, this work. It never, it never changes. Thank you. Thank you so much. We look forward to hearing more in the breakouts and I can we hear and see your enthusiasm. Our next panelist, Catherine Cooper, MBA, is a native Angelino, passionate about growing and funding early stage companies and creating an ecosystem to support entrepreneurs. Since 2017, Catherine has served as co-director of the West Coast Consortium for Technology and Innovation in Pediatrics known as CTIP. Here she heads CTIP's investment arm where she selects medical device companies with commercialization potential, high clinical impact and proprietary technology, making them ripe for investment and support. As our students may recognize, this is the same organization where one of our mentors, Dr. Juan Espinoza serves. Catherine holds a BA in human biology from Stanford University her MBA from the University of Southern California Marshall School of Business, and a certificate in venture capital finance from the UC Berkeley School of Law. Her career in medicine began by attending USC's Keck School of Medicine before transitioning to the business side of healthcare. Thank you for being with us, Catherine. We look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, guys. I'm really happy to be here. Um, Dr. Rary really killed it with having a PowerPoint presentation and that was amazing. Uh, you will just be looking at the background of my office this whole time and listening to me speak. So hopefully that isn't too sad for you. Um, but I'm jokes aside, I'm really excited to be here. And uh, I think it's really important for you guys to expose yourself to all that there is within bioscience because there is a lot. And I described this in what may or may not be relevant to you guys, but when I was younger, my parents would let me have video games and Super Mario was like all the rage. And that's the only thing I wanted to play when I was at my friend's house. Uh, and so there's nothing like, I don't know, becoming in a video game, hitting that little mushroom and then you become Super Mario and then you can do all these different things. So uh, think about your career and your journey that you are um, like starting right now as if you were in a video game, you're like collecting the coins, you're going through the levels, you're practicing, and then you're, you don't know what's on the other side until you complete what you're doing now. This is a really long-winded explanation to say like, my topic is business and investment and startups. So how does someone with my background get to the point where I am investing money in startups that we, that create medical devices that will have an outsized impact on patients and those patients that we focus on are children. Um, it seems like you just start at the end, but let me tell you a little bit about the beginning. I grew up in LA. Uh, my father was a pediatrician neonatologist. I used to think going to the hospital was really cool as a kid. Uh, does that mean I totally understood what the doctor did and like what needed to be done in terms of to learn how to get into medical school? No, 
not until I was in college and I understood the pre-med requirements. Uh, I ended up doing three years of medical school at USC before leaving to join the business of medicine. And when I say the business of medicine, I essentially joined the business world uh, without formal business knowledge or training. So what did I do? Uh, I did what you guys are doing now. I surrounded myself with people who had careers that I thought were interesting and similar uh, to what I thought I might want to, want to do. And I asked them. I took everything from a marketing course at Santa Monica College uh, to a course at um, UCLA in business development. And I was just trying to gather nuggets or back to this video game analogy, gather those little coins and like put them in my backpack and learn new stuff. So a lot of people think about, um, you know, startups are these really amazing things and uh, entrepreneurs are also very, very interesting. And it's something that people aspire to be. So uh, one of the questions that Deborah was so kind to share with me is um, some students wonder, how do you become an entrepreneur? Do you start now or do you start later? And I wanna go back to just what is an entrepreneur? So a lot of times when you ask a question, it's like, what are you actually asking? Um, and because as you can probably guess from my background, I love school. I've been to a lot of school. So uh, I always refer to, let's say like the dictionary of thesaurus when I need to know something. So according to Webster's, uh, the definition of an entrepreneur is one who organizes, manages, and assumes the risk of a business or enterprise, including entrepreneurs who work within larger organizations, meaning that you can run your own business or you can essentially run a business within an existing organization. And that's a really um, inter important distinction to make because I wanna encourage you guys to think of entrepreneurship as entrepreneurship as a lifelong practice. So back to my conversation of, do you start now or do you wait later? You can start now. However, the type of entrepreneur you will become will evolve and change. So for example, I was an entrepreneur in first grade. I was obsessed with reading books. I thought books marks were cool. My parents showed me this paper that like it changed color if you touched it. And so I like cut it up into little pieces, laminated it and sold these bookmarks to my friends for a dollar. Like, you know, was I a business person? Was I a bookmark expert? You know, no, but I liked books. I liked bookmarks and that's something I knew about. Now I fund startups who create medical technology. That's a pretty far leap, but it starts with an idea. It starts with exposure to something you know and a problem that you wanna solve. And you can do that as an entrepreneur. So the kind of three steps that I'd like you to think about in terms of entrepreneurship as a lifelong practice, meaning a framework that you apply to your life and a framework that you apply to your future career and a way that you approach challenges, whether they be within the workplace or outside of the workplace. Like first you wanna evaluate, what's the issue? What's the problem? What are the data and the facts? The next thing you wanna do is assess. So from that evaluation, what do you think are next steps, reasonable next steps and impossible next steps. And then the third thing you wanna do is operationalize, meaning now that I've outlined what I think the steps are, how am I actually gonna follow those steps to the end? And is that, that end could be the business, that end could be a suggestion to your boss or colleague about how to make a process more efficient. That would be the intrapreneur, someone who practices entrepreneurship within an existing organization. Um, I can go into a little bit about uh, what I do at CTIP, but you may have heard a lot from Dr. Espinoza, who is my colleague and longtime friend. In terms of talking about how things evolve over time, uh, if you talk to us, and I don't want to age myself, but years ago, would we have guessed that we would both be working and running a pediatric med tech accelerator? No, but we did start off in medical school together. We're friends, stay connected. I went more of the business route, you went more of the clinical route, and here we are together combining that experience in a way to support and develop startups and businesses with a focus on healthcare and bioscience. Um, so I think I'll kind of stop there. I know I've said a lot to you guys. I'm very, very excited to talk to you in the breakout rooms. Um, I think in terms of business investments and startups, there's a lot of ways that you can go. And so at the point that you are now, 
both you know scholastically and exposure wise i would encourage you guys to think big and you're in that like gathering coin stage do programs like this gather as much knowledge as you can and see what's out there because if you asked me even five or seven years ago what is a pediatric medtech accelerator i could tell you the definition but did i know exactly how to lead and run that no but i learned how to by doing the work and building upon my past domain expertise and exposure in other roles so excited for the breakouts and can't wait to see you thank you so i love it think big gather knowledge terrific thank you next on the docket allison rosenswag who is a scientific communications professional with specialty in cancer research. She is the Associate Director of Editorial for the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, known as PANCAN, which is headquartered in Manhattan Beach. Allison earned her PhD in cellular and molecular biology and completed her postdoctoral fellowship at UCLA before joining PANCAN in 2010. In her current role, Allison communicates to various audiences both professional and lay, often interpreting complex scientific and clinical concepts to patients, to those seeking general cancer information or a support network. These communications cover work supported by the organization's investments in research from biomedical publications, as well as clinical trial results. She's also one of many parents working remotely with two young children who cannot be at school during this pandemic. So ask her about that as well. Allison, you're on. Thank you, Deborah. Yes, my kids are at the park right now. So hopefully you won't have yeah. anyone scurrying behind me. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel and among these great fellow panelists. Um, so as Deborah mentioned, I am on a marketing team focused on communications at the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Um, my science background comes into play when we have um, research grants that we award and learn about outcomes from some of those projects at um, academic institutions around the country. We also um, make sure to inform patients about results of new clinical trials. Um, and like Angel mentioned, when you talk about the genome of the coronavirus or bacteria or even human genome, we're also studying and helping patients learn about their tumor genomes. So there are um, biological features in patients' tumors that can then inform what treatment might work best for them. So it's a very important role to be able to communicate in a way that is informative, is compelling and interesting, is accurate um, and also has a very clear call to action. Um, that's something we think a lot about within marketing, especially is that people should be able to read or listen to or watch something and then know how it relates to them and what they should do about it. And I think we've all learned for the last few years and certainly within this pandemic, how dangerous it can be when there's misinformation, disinformation, not reputable sources um, and how how much um, it can erode public trust. Um, when, um, as a general kind of the job opportunities within a nonprofit, um, PanCan is a pretty large organization. We're up to nearly 200 employees. So we have IT department and finance, we have operations, customer service, we have our patient central team who speaks directly to patients and their families. Um, we have a government advocacy team who's looking to make sure that pancreatic cancer gets national attention. Um, we have our development team who's out raising the money in order to allow us to do the work um, that helps um, improve outcomes for patients. We have staff that work with volunteers at their events across the country um, and raising awareness in their communities. And something that the president of my organization often reminds us is that it doesn't matter whether you're the person who's ensuring those donations come in or speaking directly to a patient or analyzing complex data. If you're processing a check or helping to make sure the database is clean and the data are safe, you're helping move that mission forward. And I think that's something really special about being part of a nonprofit organization is that it's so mission driven 
and it's a constant reminder that the work you're doing has such a powerful potential for impact in whether it's a disease state, the environment, homelessness, there's so much, obviously, that um, there's so many fantastic causes, and there's ways to incorporate your training and your passion into um, being a part of these types of organizations. Um, I look forward to chatting more with everyone in the breakout sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. That was a great overview. And look at the number of occupations in one organization. Interesting thoughts for our students. Thank you. Our next uh, panelist, Garrett Asanuma, is Director of Process Improvement within Operations in the Transplant Diagnostic Division of Thermo Fisher Scientific. His team is part of the Specialty Diagnostics Group in Canoga Park. Having joined the organization in 2016, Garrett currently leads a team focused on global strategic initiatives that enable talent, scale, and excellence. Garrett's prior experience extends across a broad range of roles, primarily within the large pharma arena, where he supports bench lab work, business operations, operational excellence, quality control, and network strategy. Many op occupational opportunities here, I think. Garrett is local, born and raised in the greater Los Angeles area. His career pathway led him to earning a degree in pharmacology from UC Santa Barbara and his master's in biotechnology from CSUCI Channel Islands. Garrett, thank you for being here and we look forward to your uh, presentation. Thanks for having me. Can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I know we're, we're a little short on time, so I'll try and cover this uh, quickly, but I wanted to give an overview of what Thermo Fisher does and, and the areas that we provide because we are a pretty large organization. Um, so when we talk about careers in our breakout sessions, um, you know, we span tons and tons of opportunities. Um, so we are a pretty large organization. We have about 75,000 employees globally, um, probably somewhere in the realm of 900 different locations around the world. So pretty much wherever you want to live, I'm sure there's a, there's a site there for you. Um, we, we cover a broad range of different types of markets that we serve um, in the biotech industry. Um, our mission is pretty, pretty simple, but I think pretty impactful. So our mission is to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer by the products that we make and the science that we enable. And I think it's uh, really proven its test of resilience during this pandemic because our businesses have served from end to end supporting the entire pandemic. Um, all of the cold storage that's used for delivering and transporting the vaccine today is mostly Thermo Fisher products. Um, when the world first found out about the pandemic, um, some of the first genetic sequence analyzers to land in China were our, our sequencers. Um, I'm specifically uh, working in the diagnostics realm. Um, so we produce um, within our specialty diagnostics group somewhere in the realm of 10 to 20 million different, uh, 10 to 20 million COVID tests a week. Um, to support the world's testing needs. Um, and we also do contract manufacturing from a drug product and vaccines perspective. Um, all of this can't be done um, unless all of our colleagues are kind of rooted in our four eyes, which are the values that we kind of operate within. Um, and that's integrity, intensity, innovation, and involvement. And those are kind of the, the traits and characteristics that we look for when we're looking to hire, um, hire folks. So our specific location in Los Angeles is based in West Hills. Um, it's focused on transplant diagnostics. So for many of you, what does that mean? Well, it really serves the solid organ transplant market, bone marrow transplants, blood transfusion, biomarkers, um, any, anyone that has known anyone or maybe you've experienced it yourself that's had like a kidney transplant or a lung transplant or a heart transplant, um, that's all doable by our technology. So today in our breakout sessions, I'll, I'll answer questions and be able to provide you guys some overviews of kind of, I call the four main pathways into our organization, which are apprenticeships, internships, our leadership development program, and then entry level positions. Um, and as you kind of saw from the previous slides, we cover a, a very broad range of skill sets and technologies and manufacturing and science. Um, so kind of the, the world is your oyster when it comes to uh, Thermo Fisher and career opportunities. Wow. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, okay. And the questions will be answered, as Garrett said, in the breakouts. Uh, Laura, are you ready to move everybody around? 
I am. Okay, I'll open all the rooms now. I would love to learn from you all. Um, maybe get some questions um, on the topic of AI if you're interested in it. Um, if you're even if you're not interested in it, maybe you you know just want to get a better understanding of how it applies, uh, maybe to uh, the things that you do want to do. Um, AI is a very pervasive field and it's ubiquitous. And I think it's going to touch uh, many more sectors and industries than we think possible um, in the near future. Okay, so let's see, who do we have on the line? So any questions from the, uh, the students? Okay, so Aisha has her uh, wisdom teeth out. That's okay, take your time. I understand. <laughs> okay, let's see. What uh what grades are you are you all in? I'm a junior. Junior, okay, excellent. And what are your your particular interests? Um, maybe going forward, getting ready to head into college. Um, after college, I'm not sure what I want to do. I just know I want to like help people and become maybe a doctor. But now, like you guys are opening my eyes to more opportunities. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, even with the uh, the, the doctor space, uh, you have many options with that as well. You have you know your medical doctor. You can become that, um, or you know um, becoming a doctor in the science fields, uh, like bio biology, chemistry. Uh, you know, computer science, that's what I chose uh, for myself. Uh, but, you know, as you come closer to, to college, of course, you'll choose a major that's right for you. Okay, let's see who else. So we have juniors here. Um, so I guess maybe um, another question for you all, what classes are you taking now to get ready to prepare for, for college? I took a couple dual enrollment classes this uh, semester. What is it? I'm sorry, I can I hear? I took a couple dual enrollment. Uh, okay. Classes. What subjects were they? Uh, kinesiology and psychology. Okay, awesome. What do you plan on applying that to? Um, uh, I kind of just want to, I was thinking about going to North Carolina, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, University of North Carolina? Yes, for okay. sports and uh, their medicine program. Awesome. So yeah, something in that field, definitely. That is, uh, that is a, a great field to get in and uh, especially related to sports. Uh, I had a chance to work with um, uh, people in kinesiology and uh, they loved it. They applied it to studying. I think one person, she worked at Nike. She got her PhD um, in the field. And she worked at Nike uh, doing a lot of analytical, um, I guess, studies on how legs perform when they're injured or before injury and after injury. And uh, she happened to not get in the field of AI. When she started, she wasn't in the field of AI or data science, but even in that space, she found that it was better for her to learn how to code or learn how to program and use data science tools uh, to understand the work that she's doing. Uh, so, you know, depending on which space, um, you know, of kinesiology that you're going to be in, uh, it's very likely that AI will touch, um, will touch every sector uh, related to that space. So, uh, be prepared for working with uh, computers uh, in a variety of ways. Okay, so Henry Armstrong said he was a freshman. Okay, awesome. Awesome, awesome. So were there any questions related, any follow-up questions that you had related to the, I guess, the five-minute intro uh, related to AI? Does it seem like an interesting field to get into, or is it something that uh, is that particularly your taste? And I'm open to hearing honest answers because this is a uh, uh, an open forum. Well, I have a question. 
Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, you go. You go first, Stephanie. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I was. You have to do. Um, com you're doing computer science, correct? Yes, that's correct. Is it like what do you have to do in that field? Because I don't really. I hear about it, but I don't actually know what they do. Okay. In that field. Okay, that's a very, uh, very good question. So one thing, maybe I should share this. So as a computer scientist, uh, we have. Uh, multiple tasks. There are different types of computer scientists as well. Uh, when it comes down to, for example, with my role with Herexi Health, uh, you know, although I'm in this uh, kind of like leadership position, we do have programmers who work on different aspects of the product that we're developing. So a computer scientist uh, could work on, let's use Instagram, for example. A uh, computer scientist could work on the user interface which is, you know, how does the design of the application look in terms of its aesthetics, uh, the colors that, you know, the app uses, uh, you know, whether certain buttons, uh, you know, flash when you press them or, you know, it swipes left or right. So there are people who work on that aspect. They are computer scientists. Uh, computer scientists are also people who work on what we call the, the back end of the, the software. So they're focused on, you know, how to, uh, get the database to store all of your pictures, uh, get the, the system to, to process uh, the live streams that you, that you have going on. Uh, you know, all of this information that, that even Instagram has to, to store at one time needs to be categorized, needs to be organized so that you and I or other users can easily use this app without any uh, bugs or, you know, different types of, um, uh, issues that may happen. So I say computer scientists, they come in different forms. So you have people who design websites, people who uh, use coding applications to create um, or to program self-driving cars, for example. Uh, they can program airplanes to, to fly automatically without having the pilot to, to manually uh, drive it itself. Uh, you know, there's different applications and people who can program your phone. Uh, as well. So it's, it's really, I don't want to give a, a bad overview of what computer scientists do in terms of like just sitting at their computer all day coding. Some people do do that and some people are uh, more hands on with the, the physical product. So it's, it's a different look. Um, computer science is a very broad field and depending on what you want to get into, um, I think another field is like fashion, for example, there are people who program uh, certain applications to show off fashion clothes. Uh, so, you know, it's a very lucrative field to get into and the options are, are quite wide in my opinion. All right, welcome. And Chris, I know you have a question. Oh, I know yeah. the rooms are closing, so I'll try to answer very fast. Oh, they are, oh gosh. Okay, well, I was just wondering when it comes to artificial intelligence, is that person that is able to do that, is, is that person most likely gonna work for a consultant that, uh, helps a larger company or work within the company who may need AI applications developed? Oh, did she leave us? <laughs> I think she did. Oh. Oh, I see. We got a we got a new uh, guest speaker here. Oh, hey, Garrett. That was funny. <laughs> yeah, I was in the middle of a question too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Well, um, great. We've got uh, students, uh, America, Henry, Stephanie, and Asia with us today. Great. And um, and then myself and and Dave are also on the line. So um, why don't you go ahead and take it away and. Sure. So I guess uh, in the interest of time, I don't want to bore people. So maybe I'll, I'll first open it up to the students. If you guys have any questions um, about careers, opportunities, focus areas, um, anything that kind of tickles your fancy. And if not, I can kind of jump into a little bit of the four options um, for entry level career ways that I presented earlier. And again, Garrett's with Thermo Fisher, a very yes. large global company that hires thousands of people. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so ask your questions if, if you feel like you might want to work there. 
Yeah, it's a it's a huge company. So for those that you know aren't uh, are looking to kind of try something new, maybe down the line and live in Europe or live in Brazil or China, I mean it's a huge organization. And like I said, the world is kind of your oyster. Um, whether you're an engineer, programmer, plastics designer, environmentalist, um, you know we kind of cover all the all the different products. Um, and I think mostly in, I'd say kind of the, the pandemic perspective, our portfolio of offerings has really come to light because we are able to serve, um, you know, every, every aspect of, of the pandemic um, and the science behind it, um, which has been pretty powerful and, and pretty, you know, fun to be a part of. And, and you have a, an internship program, right? Yes. So a student going to college would be uh, considered for that that's one of the requirements there is that yes. if you're you're in college then you can you can uh, go to Thermo Fisher for an internship but yep yeah yeah what, we, we have we have um, our apprentice program um, which we partner with you know Deborah on um, and we have our internships which uh, we just kind of got through the last the latest round of intern hiring a few months ago um, but I'd say the apprentice program is really designed around getting your foot use or getting your foot in the door and kind of acclimated to what it's like to work in a lab, you know, basic lab settings, basic manufacturing techniques. Um, and then the internship program is really a bit more focused on kind of key projects. So um, we just hired some interns that are really focused on helping us deliver new capabilities. So um, one of the interns is looking at things like 3D printing in a manufacturing environment. Um, one of the other interns or um, kind of rotational folks that we have are helping me look at um, augmented reality in manufacturing. How do we leverage um, kind of this remote capability because, you know, Thermo Fisher is so big um, and travel is pretty restricted. How can we still accomplish, you know, multi-site manufacturing and projects without physically being there? Um, so we have interns working on that. Um, and then we have our leadership development program, which is um, really kind of after you've graduated from college. So we have a um, kind of a collegiate leadership program and then we have a graduate leadership program um, so there's a different level of the leadership program depending on if you just have your bachelor's or if you got your master's or your MBA um, so those are focused around six to eight month uh, rotational programs so you kind of get to experience uh, a few different jobs in a span of you know two two and a half years um, and you can work in three four different jobs at to the three different sites if you wanted to. Um, so we've got a couple of folks right now at our Los Angeles site here that just finished up a year in San Francisco at our San Francisco site. Um, so it's a great way to really get exposure to different career opportunities early on without really kind of picking a, a kind of a, a very narrow path. Um, so it's great for folks to explore. Um, and then as you know, most other companies, we have our normal entry level positions, which are focused in manufacturing, um, laboratory R&D, quality, um, quality control. Um, so those are kind of the four big pathways to, to kind of get into to biotech. Does anyone have any questions about anything that they do there? What's the main thing? I know Thermo Fisher does a lot, has a lot of devices that you make. Yes. Uh, but locally, it's not really devices that you're making. You're doing something else, right? Yeah. So locally here at our site, um, we manufacture, um, I call it the reagents, um, reagent manufacturing di di for diagnostic purposes. Um, so if you want like a kidney transplant, lung transplant, heart transplant, blood transfusion, um, and you have to find a match um, between a donor and a recipient, we produce the products that can, you know, sequentially tell you, um, you know, are you a good match or will your body reject the other person's organ? Um, and that's uh, what we've been supporting. And that's what this business has been doing in the Los Angeles area for probably almost 40 years now. Um, the original company was uh, called One Lambda, which was started out of UCLA. Um, and Thermo Fisher acquired it uh, in 2012, I believe. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, the other big part of their business, um, they make medical devices like uh, refrigerators that uh, cool things down to 100 minus Celsius. <laughs> yep. And uh, takes a special technician to work on those uh, machines. But uh, when you go tour some of the different uh, facilities, uh, you'll see Thermo Fisher equipment is everywhere in, in the labs all over LA County. Yep. Yeah. 
I saw I saw your question, Aisha. So the way it works is um, we actually will sequence proteins. So we have um, all of the different sequences and every year we get kind of, I call it like a, a population update of kind of what are the new um, sequences that have popped up in the world. Um, and we have panels, we create products um, that detect those proteins. So for example, if you have um, if your body expresses a protein, um, we'll just call it A1, and our kit, our product has a, a test to detect A1, then we'll test you, and then we'll test the donor or the recipient, and if you both have A1, then you guys are a match. Um, and we do that for a whole series of different proteins, which are called HLA proteins, um, which is human leukocyte antigens, and um, we actually make those. Uh, so a lot of our manufacturing is cell culture based here in Los Angeles. So we produce a lot of proteins from cells that we use to then make the products with those proteins. Yeah, good question. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? Stephanie, what about you? America, Stephanie? You want to say something? No, it. Oh, sorry. It just seems like really interesting what you do because I've never thought about how people actually have to like see if they're a match or not. I know people test it, but I didn't know it was like people like you and like your company that you work at. Yep. All right. Any questions? Otherwise, I I think we'll get booted in a little bit. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we have been uh, talking with Thermo Fisher for a while now about setting up uh, a pre-apprenticeship program yep. to tie into an apprenticeship program. Yep. And then uh, Thermo Fisher would actually, if, if they like you during the pre-apprenticeship, may actually hire you then while you're still going to school on a flexible schedule. So it's kind of a neat thing. Looks like we're getting another person here. And feel free, you know, to, to um, just have conversation. You don't have to worry about, you know, specific questions. If you just want to talk to these people, they're, they're um, you know, pretty senior level at some of these companies and can give you a lot of good advice. Hey, Allison, uh, hey. it's Chris Cagle here with uh, four students uh we enjoyed your um your speech your your presentation we've got uh america henry stephanie and uh asia <laughs> let me know if i'm saying that wrong um and then uh, dave whelan is on on with us as well so would you like to uh uh reintroduce yourself and say a few words yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, so as a reminder, I'm um, in a nonprofit setting. I work at the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Um, I'm in the marketing department working on communications focused on scientific and clinical content. Um, so if anyone has questions about cancer research, about communication, scientific communications, about the science PhD path, any of those things, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, if, um, if someone uh, wants to get into your field, you touched on this a little bit, but what, what would be the best pathway, you know, certainly college, but uh, internship opportunities, apprenticeships, anything, is it better to start with a nonprofit as opposed to, you know, for-profit company? Any suggestions there? Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on what what your passions are. Um, what's great about a nonprofit, especially a larger scale nonprofit, which is nothing compared to like uh, the gentleman that was at Fisher, Thermo Fisher, like those are enormous nonprofits aren't that big. Um, but pro nonprofits still have a lot of the same kind of job opportunities in corporate and corporations, which would, you know, if you want to work in customer service and answer the phones and help um, direct people who have questions about signing up for an event or uh, questions about their, um, about any of like kind of logistical type questions. We have um, an accounting department, IT. We maintain several databases because we are collecting financial information from people who make donations. 
as well as health information. So we need to make sure those are kept secure. Um, we have a patient central team who talks directly to patients and their family members about any um, decision making they have to make or any, um, any of the challenges that they're experiencing with the disease. Um, we have community engagement that works with volunteers out all the way across the country. So there's lots of different ways you can get involved. And I think um, one of the models that PanCan has that I'm very proud of and, and think is a very important is having really this comprehensive approach that we're talking to patients, we're funding research, we're advocating at the, Nash, at the federal government level, um, we're raising money and awareness for the disease. And so it's an important combination and um, really holistic way of looking at it. Um, pancreatic cancer has the lowest survival rate of any major cancer in the US. Um, so it's certainly a disease with lots of opportunity and lots of need. Um, and it's important to be able to show kind of that urgency and need when we're asking for donations and support from the community and also to show the impact of what's happening, that there's progress being made, that their dollars are going to a good cause. Um, so that's a lot of the writing I do is kind of both sides of that, of showing really the problem and then some of the solutions and some of the um, incremental project progress, but still progress that's happening. And feel free, uh, any of you, if you'd like to just jump in um, and ask a question or just make a comment, you don't have to ask permission or anything. Um, so does your, does your organization uh, not only fund research, but do you also do research or do you just fund others to do it? So it's a combination. Um, we have a chief science officer, a chief medical officer that really drive a lot of um, the research that we both the strategy for the research that we fund in the field and academic settings, as well as the research we conduct. Um, mm -hmm. We speak with more patients than any other organization who um, with pancreatic cancer patients. So we're able to really try to learn from those patients. Um, we have a patient registry that patients can enter their own data in. We also have a, um, a service that patients can send in their tumor tissue and a saliva sample and get mm -hmm sequencing done to then help them understand all of their treatment options. So that's something uh, that we've How does that work? Is that, is that open to everybody or just people who participate in something? So it's free of charge, which is amazing. Mm. Um, it's something that has to be coordinated with the patient's doctor. Um, mm. the, the saliva sample is easier, but the tumor sample, it can be from their primary, from the tumor in their pancreas, or if it has spread to anywhere um, in the body, we can use tumor sample from there. And the patient will get, and their doctor will get a list of kind of all the alterations that make their cancer cells different than their healthy cells. And if they happen to have been born with something with a genetic mutation that increased their risk of getting pancreatic cancer, that's important information to share with their family. And it also could influence their treatment decisions and the options available to them. Um, so that's one of our really flagship programs. And yeah. it's something we've published papers and journals and presented at um, conferences on and something that is really not just um, in a really active way that we've been able to move the field forward. And we did learn through our program that the patients who do have some sort of mutation in their tumor that matches to a treatment option, that they can live up to a year longer than mm -hmm. patients who don't, which is when you're talking about a disease with very low survival rates, a year is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so to do that type of testing, what occupation would a person have or need to know? So that the labs, um, I'm sure they have biostaticians, statisticians, mm. um, biology, biochemistry, really looking at the samples and being able to, first of all, decipher um, the tumor cells from the healthy cells and then do um, DNA and RNA analysis. So it's kind of all of that. And then there's medical professionals who look at the results and can have um, an awareness of the clinical trial options or the different drugs that might work. 
Like for example, somebody might have an alteration in their tumor that's more commonly found in lung cancer, but there's a drug that blocks it or that works well with patients in lung cancer. So we can try to help um, inform patients and their doctors about that option that they might that might work well for them as well. Oh. All right. Well, thank you so much. I bet we're about to get cut off any second here. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we They've given more warnings this time. The first one I was just <laughs> mid sentence. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I didn't get to say thank you to anyone else. I just got cut off. <laughs> um, yeah, I might have time for one quick question if anyone wants to wants to jump in. They're transitioning now, but thank you all for listening. Right. <laughs> you guys can also, you know, write in the chat box too if you just had a quick question you wanted to ask. That's okay. Hey, Catherine. Hey, hey. Hey. This is Chris Cagle and um we have Dave Whelan with us and four of our students. Oh, uh, America, yeah, America, Henry, Stephanie, Asia. And uh, maybe you'd like to remind us what your talk was about and um, introduce yourself again. Sure, sure. Is Dave going too, or are you just hanging out in this uh, Zoom, Dave? Um, uh, my talk was about what I do in business in investment and in supporting entrepreneurs specifically when it within healthcare, I run a pediatric med tech accelerator, oh. but my overall kind of like maybe all over the place talk was around thinking about entrepreneurship as a lifelong mindset that you should apply to your regular life, your career, um, and literally everything. Wow. So uh, you, you fund startups in bioscience or, or other Correct. industries too. Bioscience is the broader category. I specifically fund med medical device startups, which fits oh. into the category of med tech within bioscience. Oh, okay. But, uh, mm. let's see, Stephanie, America, I'm assuming Henry Armstrong, the Armstrong yeah. comment. Henry, uh, yep. And Aisha, hit me with like any questions. Literally, like, what did you eat for lunch today? What's your favorite color? Something about bioscience. It's your eight minutes. So, what do you want to know? Ooh, favorite book. Oh, is this my favorite book? Oh, this is a tough question. Oh, uh, well, oh, so my favorite book is Pride and Prejudice. Like, hands down, love it. Also love the original BBC movie, not the one with Kieran Knightley, total trash, doesn't really adhere to the book. The BBC one is like pre your time and dates me, but uh, I love a period piece and I love Ray Precious. Anybody else? What are you guys into? Oh, sorry, I have a question. You went to three schools, correct? Like oh, yes. colleges? Berkeley, USC, and Stanford? Yep. How was that? Was it like hard because, like going to three schools? Well, I didn't go to all of them at the same time. Yeah, so, like differently, correct? <laughs> um, they were each challenging in their own ways, but uh, you know, school is school. Like you kind of, you put your head down and you do it, but I would encourage you to do other activities while you're in school that aren't just like learning. You know, for Stanford, I was an undergraduate, so I just graduated from high school. I did a lot of activities at Stanford besides the fact that I was pre-med and majored in human biology, like a bunch of stuff. I was on the crew team. Uh, I was in a sorority. Uh, I feel like I spent most of my time doing non-academic extracurriculars. And I loved college because I made some of my lifelong friends there. And that's been a really, really important network, both personally and professionally. Uh, I went to USC for business school because I'm from LA, I wanted to go to business school while working um, because I wanted to be able to help myself pay for school in real time. And uh, the program I did at Berkeley 
was a shorter program that was actually only a week that results in a certificate that was specifically focused on venture capital. So I did that after Stanford and after the MBA and after I had worked at CTIP for a couple of years because I wanted to refine my investment skills through that program. You have a couple of questions that came in. Oh, let me check out the, uh, the chat here. Let's see. Oh, favorite book. How did you decide this is a field you want to go into? This is an interesting question um, because I would say I didn't. Um, it's more like I did a lot of things and then I ended up landing here at CTEC. When you say the field, so I wanted to go into healthcare pretty early on. As I mentioned earlier, my dad, my dad was a pediatrician and neonatologist. I grew up around medicine my whole life. Uh, if you ask my little brother, he thinks medicine is disgusting, like gross, doesn't want to go to a hospital, like doesn't want to look at a band-aid, like nothing. And I was like, dad, tell me about surgery while I'm eating food. That was me. Um, but I like science. I liked knowing how things worked. And then when I realized you could combine that with patients and actually get to know people in an intimate way that relates to their health and help them, I was like, Shh, we're sold. When I left medical school, I still liked the patient impact aspect of healthcare. So I asked myself, how could I do that? And I could continue to do that by working in businesses that had to do with healthcare. So the downstream effect is on patients, but I'm no longer like one-on-one -on -one meeting with them, but the solutions and investments that I'm working on help them down the line. Um, so I don't know, it chose me. I kind of chose it. I don't have an amazing answer for you. Um, how did I get recruited for the sorority? This is a funny story and great. Um, my best friend in my freshman dorm came to my room one day and said like, Hey, Catherine, like they're having rush this week. Like I'm going to go. And I was like, what? I thought we were going to be roommates next, next year. Like, what is this? She was like, we can come like anyone can register. I said, all right. And I didn't know that much about sororities at the time, like literally nothing. Uh, so I went to rush Stanford does rush in the spring. So by then you already have friends. Um, and I also like networking. So you went to a different, lot of different parties, you meet a lot of different women, uh, and then fast forward to the end, I, I joined one of them. Like, it's interesting, but then it's not interesting. When I say I rushed, like, kind of as a joke, like, it was just because my friend was like, hey, let's do this, and I said, okay. Um, but this is to say that, like, I go pretty hard with the groups that I end up being a part of, whether they are CTIP, where they're Dave asking me to participate in the BioFlex program, um, whether they are the other things I do supporting women in STEM in Los Angeles. I think it's really important if you're a part of a group um, to really come to that group and try to make an impact in that group and make that group better than when you joined it. And that can literally be everything from like, I don't know, you're in like a cooking group with your friends, you're in a sorority, you like to craft, or you're in a business organization and you're working with a team professionally. So that's the attitude that I kind of take to stuff. It usually works out. But let's see, Henry's been kind of quiet. Aisha, I see your little A square. Anybody? Cool. I feel like you guys have a question there. It's just not appearing. Oh, no, wait, there's something in the chat. No, it just says thank you. Oh, well. Well, I enjoy talking to you guys. I hope you enjoyed being talked at um, by me. I think your questions are interesting. I think it's really, really lovely that you participated in this program. And you don't know what you don't know. So Well, <laughs> that was good. Angel, hi, how are you? Oh, hi. <laughs> We just, this is, I think we're still learning this transitioning process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know we always get cut off. Um, well, uh, thank you in advance for, for doing this and coming on and talking with us. And uh, 
uh, we have four students with us, uh, America, Stephanie, Aisha, Arm, uh, Henry, and uh, David Whelan is also on as well. Right hey, so, Angel, great. Thank you. Glad you could make it. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm loving just sharing uh, as much as information as I can share with everyone to give them a better uh, idea about opportunities. Um, so I, I guess I'll just like slightly reintroduce a little bit of my background, just to uh, remind everyone. Uh, before that, I will say, just if you have any questions, please just unmute yourself and interrupt me. If I say something you don't understand or you just want more information, please just let me know. So I work in the field of genomics, which is really the intersection of biology chemistry and computer science. So it's really a fun field to work in nowadays. Um, I get, I think one of my favorite aspects is working with uh, people with so many different types of backgrounds. So I'm always learning something new. Um, and, you know, I think in this age where, you know, we've been uh, living under a pandemic, sequencing technology has been uh, very much at the forefront to help um, deal and address some of the most pressing problems. So like sequencing technology, sequencing technology has been the basis of vaccine design um, because we need to understand the genetic material of the virus and how it changes over time. Um, and just to understand, you know, if someone, uh, you know, has the virus or not. Is everyone familiar, has any questions regarding uh, sequencing technology or any other uh, questions related to my background? Well, how does, uh, how does someone get into sequencing technology? And where, where do we, what do you study and what degree do you get to, to be able to do such a thing? <laughs> Um, well, it could be, it's really such a diverse field that, um, that even like biology or chemistry, I studied, so I have a background in biochemistry, so it's kind of like the intersection of both, and I, did, I also studied computer science as well, so it's, um, if you are just very interested, uh, you know, how I approach a problem usually is like, I want to, I there's this problem, how do I solve it? Um, and usually that leads you to understanding so many different fields beyond um, what you may think of. I, for example, uh, started in a biochemistry lab trying to understand uh, diabetes. Um, I've always been drawn to infectious diseases uh, or helping develop something like a therapeutic or a drug that will impact uh, someone's life in a positive way. And I thought I wanted to be a doctor at some point, but once I get into the lab and I saw the possibility about creating something that will help uh, someone like my grandmother who was suffering from diabetes, uh, I think that's what kind of drew me into uh, delving into more lab research. And from there, um, you know, I was very lucky to do research that just kind of further fostered and helped encourage um, learning different types of aspects of uh, of what it of what it means to develop a drug, um, and definitely communicating with either counselors and 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 teachers that helped guide me through that process is very very important. It's always important to have someone there that you can talk to and communicate um, uh, your interests because they will change over time. And someone that has more experience to guide you and to expose you to different areas is very, very helpful and has been very helpful for me. Earlier, um, Stephanie was asking about college. Do you have any tips for what and how to choose which college to go to for this type of work to study? How did you figure out where to go to college for this? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a little, I think for me, um, uh, I think I had an interest in 
um, mostly how I was going to say, I didn't want to go to school in California. I think I, because I was born and raised here, that I just wanted something very new uh, to, to explore. Um, but that's kind of, when, and, and when it came to academics, um, I always asked the question, um, are they doing the type of research that I want to, that I want to do? So I think when it came to schools, it's a good idea to look at um, if you're interested in research, look at the type of research that the, that the institution or the school is doing, um, because that will give you a better idea of like, uh, if, if it's, it's, a, if the right fit for you, if there are people there that, um, may be able to mentor you, uh, that, that you'll have opportunities to work in a lab that will, um, give you the opportunity to work in, you know, whether it's, you know, a, a specific type of disease, um, or just a, a very specific type of, uh, you know, if you want to work in biology or in, in agriculture, um, it's, there's, there's a, I, I think overall, I think that's a good start. Yeah, that's a good tip. Um, anyone have any what? questions? You want to say something? Go ahead. <laughs> We have about a we minute left. <laughs> one, a few last questions. Um, one thing I will just voluntarily uh, give you guys as, a, as advice, because I do have a broad background. One of the things that uh, really helped me was um, not being afraid to explore different types of fields that, um, that, that you're interested in, because at some point, uh, we live in a world where, you know, we don't, scientists don't work by themselves. They work part of a bigger team. Um, so it's very useful to have many different people of different backgrounds come together um, to solve a challenging problem. Um, so please do that and um, enjoy it, you know, learn as much as you can and and get to know many different types of people, I think is very, very helpful because you get to understand how other people think um, and someone else's perspective. All right, thank you so much. With five seconds left, you did great. <laughs>
if I were you, I would find boring. Um, I thought I could either do a round robin or fingers crossed, get some volunteers to you know, say anything, ask a question. It can be related to what I do. It cannot. It can be like, what do you eat for breakfast? Whatever. Like, let's have a fun eight minutes and talk about some interesting stuff. You've been through the BioFlex program, which uh, I'm really excited about. And I think it's an amazing initiative for LA. Um, I wish something like this had existed when I was in, you know, like middle school, high school. I can't remember what I was doing back then related to being interested in science outside of um, basically begging my dad to take me to the hospital with him. And then I would just get dropped off in the doctor's lounge because like they won't let a kid run around the hospital. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so then I tried to drink coffee as a kid and like eat old donuts. Anyway, um, I don't want to, like, this is your eight minutes. So, uh, I'll start with, uh, hang on. What would you like to know? If I murdered your name, I apologize. Um, what's up? We can even start with like, literally what do you eat for lunch today? Um, well, like, you know how you said that you liked school? Growing yeah. Up? Well, I feel like since we're like in high school, it's a little hard learning from virtual learn like online. I want to know how you stayed like motivated, even though you didn't go to virtual school, like how you stayed motivated in school. Okay, that's a, you know what? That's a really, really great question. And I think about it a lot of what it would be like to be a high school student today um, and how much of middle school and high school like I enjoyed like seeing my friends you know, like meeting people at their lockers at a certain time, like how much could happen in a day because you had so many periods, like all these different things that you guys don't have now. So what I'll say is how I remained motivated doing online school, not as a high schooler, but as an adult. So um, Deborah was really kind enough to mention my background and I have an MBA. I have a master's in business administration from USC. And I did that program entirely online. So USC has a couple different types of MBA programs. One is the traditional in-person full-time program. It's two years, you go to school, go to class, and all this other stuff. Another one is a part-time program that's about three to three and a half years long, and you do that over the weekend. Those are for working professionals. And then when I started, I was in the fourth cohort, literally meaning the fourth semester they ever taught this program of the, of the online MBA. And it's like, why would you do, why would you sign up for class online? I was working at the time. Um, school is expensive. I needed to be able to pay for graduate school um, with loan assistance and myself in real time. I traveled a lot for work at the time because I was doing business development work within healthcare. And so I used to see clients throughout California. So the thought of going to class and driving through LA traffic only to miss class a lot seemed impractical. Um, so I literally did school over Zoom four years before you guys had to. Um, and what kept me motivated through that program was my cohort and like my colleagues. We like had a what's up thread with everybody where we were not even talking about class. Like people were sharing memes, like what they, like what they cook for dinner. Like people who my class were kids were like, this is what they're doing, you know? And I mean, we were full on chatting like while well, class was going on. And that just helped because you felt connected to a community even though we didn't see each other in person. We did see in pers each other in person for one full week at the very beginning of the year and a half program. But then after that, unless they were a student who lived in LA and I made a conscious effort to try to see them in person, um, we just lived online. So what the light at the end of the tunnel for me was like, I'm doing this program because I'm trying to get exposed to things scholastically that I wouldn't normally learn at work. And the only way I'm gonna do that is if I learn this well. And also I'm paying my own money for school and like, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna learn something. Um, but what really kept me through it was talking to the other students and being like, is this professor's like video working? Is there a lag? Did they get new pillows? You know, like stupid stuff like that. But honestly, it really kept me engaged in the program to do it online twice a week for two years. And oh my God, they're two minutes. And I'm so sorry, I stole like everybody's time. But Edgar, um, Edgar, as a matter of fact, is interested in pediatrics, aren't you? Uh, yes. So I am. why don't you? You're, you're right here. This is your chance. Perfect. So like uh, like you said, you went into medicine. What exactly like deferred you from staying in medicine and, and going to business? Oh, okay. So 
if you haven't talked to Dr. Espinoza already about being a pediatrician, you should uh, like really pick his brain about this. He's an amazing resource. And my father was also a pediatrician. So I was around like child medicine all the time. The long story is medicine is a long journey. It's not just four years of medical school, it's four years of medical school, three years of residency, two years of fellowship, starting practice. So I basically tapped out in year three of four of medical school, but in year three of 10 of the actual journey. I knew that I liked medicine, but I didn't like what the journey was doing to me personality and life-wise. And so once I came to the realization that I could still have an impact on patient outcomes, but in this whole world called business, which I had literally never thought about because my dad was a doctor, I was like, oh, I could just leave and get a job. So I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, like, this, the explanation is people are much more excited about the answer than when they get the answer, they're like, oh, lame. <laughs> um, but uh, Taisha, anybody else? Damiana? Wendy J. Um, I have a question. Um, so what really like made you want to, I don't know, I don't know if you want to answer, but what really made you, like you said, like towards your third year, what really made you want to step away from that and join like the business world? And like, so I want to be a doctor, but my biggest fear was always, what if I like go in too deep with like the studying and I'm like at one point I'm just like done with it so what made you really take that step and say okay well it's time for me to step back from that and start a new journey okay so the real answer is um oh hi everyone <laughs> oh they you got switched already yes uh hi everyone okay well, you know what, let me just interrupt for you a second here. Um, yeah. It seems that we didn't get a notice that it was time for um, for Catherine to move. So they were in the middle of a sentence. So guys, we're gonna just change ropes here. This happens and Angel's on now. So if you remember, he's got a background in lots of different areas and the group here is a mix of, um, of schools they're mostly, mostly the interest has been in the medical part of the world. So I think it's interesting for them to understand from your, from the lab and the research end and folks. So maybe just give them a little reminder of, you know, some of your areas that you might, you know, answer questions. And then Edgar D and uh, De Demiana and, and Christine, hopefully we'll have questions for you. Yes. And just as a reminder, anyone that has any questions, please feel free to interrupt if I say something that you don't understand. Uh, just unmute yourself and you know, let's have a good uh, conversation. I'm here to just give you everything that I know. So just ask plenty of questions. And feel free um, to tell them to take their mics off and call on them. I'm gonna rotate yes. out. So it's, it's good if you guys just unmute yourself and uh, interrupt me if you can. Hey, Deborah. Hi. Um, if there was no warning, all of a sudden Catherine disappeared. I know, that's why I said there's no warning. I gave the two minute warning, but that's all that I can do. We didn't see it. See, that's the thing. It says I put broadcast message yeah. to all. So that's why I was asking if you saw it last time because one of the other speakers said she did it. I did. Um, I thought I did see it last time, but I didn't this time. You watch. I'm going to do it right now. Okay. Four minutes remaining. And then I'm going to click broadcast. Yep, it says, uh-huh, it's okay. there. So maybe I'll, I'll do another one right at the time, changing now, switching speakers now, something like that. Well, didn't you already switch? Because Angel came in. Or well, yeah, yeah, the next time. Oh, the next, okay, good. Yeah, that's good, good, good. Okay, um, you want to, I was just in with, um, De, De, I can't, how can I never say her word, her name, with D and De, Demiana. So if you can move me into another room. Um, okay, you were in uh, with, okay, let me move you into, I'm not gonna move you into the room with Chris. I'll move That's you fine. into Jamelli. Um, let's do the last room. Okay. Um, or four, if she has, okay, let me, yeah, let me move you here. How do I do it? 
High school kids don't talk much, Chris says. Okay, let me you have to them. call on them. And that's what I've been, that's what I prompted them in my emails. I said, feel free to call on them one by one. Yeah, exactly. Why don't I remember how to move you? Oh. I don't see. Hold on. Um, Deborah, where are you? Oh, I'm still recording. I should stop recording. Is that my recording? Oh, and remind me to press record when we go back into the main room because I oh, stopped okay. the recording. So when I'm seeing recording now, it's me. This is my recording, so I should stop. Yeah. Oops. Sorry. Crickets. What's everybody having for dinner? Honestly, like. What, um, what do you look for in startup companies for you to be able to put them into your portfolio? Really great question. So we look at the solution. Do we feel that the technology is legitimate? Meaning, is the technology at the point that they've said that it's proposed? We invest in really early stage companies, so they can be a concept. But if you're telling me that you are working on a very specific screw for orthopedic surgery for children, uh, we wanna make sure that the problem that you're so saying you're solving for is actually a problem. So like you may be making a better screw, but does that orth orthopedic surgeon actually need a better screw and will that lead to better patient outcomes? Because if you're saying like your screw is like at a 96% and all the other screws are at a 95%, like, okay, big blow. Uh, the second thing we look for is team. So are there enough people who have certain levels of expertise on the team? Business expertise, clinical expertise, and engineering expertise, because these are devices. We look at the timeline of how long we think this product will take to go to market. And then we look at, is it feasible for CTIP to support? Do we have both the capital and um, connections in our network to truly help this company? And if we don't, we won't accept them because we want them to succeed and we want them to succeed with our help. I think Deborah's muted. Or she, oh, she's on the phone. Um, Let's see. Devin, um, I was just, I didn't realize my mic was off. Um, I thought we'd get Devin and Jose involved. Devin, um, turn on your mic because you were interested in business and possibly psychology. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if there's any connection here, but, you know, certainly it might be something of interest. We only have two minutes. So, Devin, do you have any questions? Uh, I'm kind of like in, in the middle of something. So just. Let's pay it to, let's get in with here, okay? I'll move on to Jose. Um, Jose, you had told us you were very, you were interested in mechanical engineering, biomanufacturing, including medical devices. So Catherine would be a great person to ask some questions of. Um, I can't really think of any, any like questions right now. Do you have any no desire to start out on your own? What happened? Well, anyway, so if you want to start on your own or not, what you'll need to say is uh, training in engineering. And so that will involve more school. And then from there, you can either become an engineer in a medical device company. You can spin out and decide to create your own medical device company. You can advise early stage companies. There's so many things you can do. I would encourage you to think of like whatever the terminal degree that you get, whether that's in your major or whether that's a master's, like that's not the end. It is part of your journey and you can pivot that into whatever. Um, I think uh, Devon had a question about uh, psychology. So I loved psych when I was in medical school. And I think it's really, really interesting. I think there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, we have some companies in our portfolio that are addressing uh, mental health amongst children and adolescents. Their at-home platform has been especially utilized during the pandemic as we all struggle with mental health issues, being stuck at home and working and living at home. And those challenges are very unique uh, to teenagers and young adults. So their platform has both a digital health app and like a medical device component. So Demon, if you're interested in psychology, know that there's a lot of things you can do like with that. And it's not just treating patients one-on-one. -on -one. It can be working with companies who are working in the space. It can be working on the technologies that help people with mental health issues. There is, 
I just encourage you to think broadly and think outside the box after you kind of double down on, let's say, a psychology uh, degree or class or something like that. And Jasmine and Juliana both were interested in nursing. Did you have any other questions, either of you, or thoughts, comments? Nursing is great. We have a nurse innovation group. Oh. Well, looks like we're switching. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so there was actually a two-minute warning. I don't know um, if uh, I did see it. Yeah, yeah, I had a good yeah. heads up. Okay, good, good, good. So this group, you have a group here. Um, everybody remembers Angel, and this group we have the two ladies in the group are interested. We're interested in nursing. They they felt Devin is was possibly interested in a mix of psychology and business, and Jose actually was looking at a, a, a mechanical engineering and how that all relates. So I'll give you an idea of this group and folks, you know, to have a chat with Angel and find out a little bit more about him and careers. Yes, you guys have a very good uh, diverse background. And uh, first I wanted to say, just uh, meet yourself. Um, I'll give a little bit of more background about what I do. Um, so feel free to interrupt me, please. Uh, I'm here to just, uh, give you as much as information as I can so you guys can understand the different types of roles that uh, are available to you guys in science. Um, and since you guys have a very broad background um, and my, back, my background is very broad, one of the biggest things that I have taken from working in an um, in industry and very different fields is that, actually one of my favorite parts is talking to uh, being part of a big team and talking to people that have so many different types of backgrounds. And it's made me realize how important it is to know how to communicate your ideas um, and uh, being able to talk to biologists and chemists and computer scientists, mm -hmm. all really that come together to help solve one main goal. And so like the current uh, program that we are establishing at work is the COVID surveillance program. So I work with different scientists uh, from many different levels, that ones that work in the lab. I work with ones that work with computers. Um, and, uh, you know, I have some other colleagues that work with doctors and nurses that are dealing with patients that have COVID um, so that we can establish a, a relationship of, um, you know, how would it look like to, to gather samples uh, and send, the, send that to us and that we can then process it through our pipeline. So really it requires, I think uh, there's a lot of things at play uh, that make science very in interesting and uh, not just in the lab setting, but in the clinical side. So if you're looking to become a nurse or a doctor, um, we're all, uh, it's, all these worlds converge really. Um, I just had another student, another student before we switched rooms who said, can I be a doctor that does research? Um, and that's definitely a possibility. Um, you know, it, if it weren't for doctors that did research, we wouldn't be able to test the vaccines that we designed. Um, and vaccines are, are very much based on the type of technology that I do at work, which is analyzing the genetic material of organisms. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, has anyone uh, have any questions, something that I've said that may not make sense or just any other questions in general? Oh my gosh, you can answer, you can do that. How about the career pathways? If these you know, students are in high school at this point, do you have any, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your career pathway and how you got through it? Yeah, um, I definitely, early on in my career, uh, in, in school, I was adamant about being a doctor. That's what I wanted to do. Um, that's what I thought my passion was. And right up until I think the first year of college that I got into a lab setting and started to do a little bit of research, um, I immediately felt that, oh my God, this is, this is for me. I love 
I love the lab. I love the idea of creating things, um, helping develop new types of medicines and therapeutics that will impact people's lives uh, in a positive way. Um, and it was funny, a com it was a funny conversation I had with one of my cousins who was at Berkeley and had already decided that he was going to become a doctor. And he said that the first time he got into a lab setting, um, uh, he was like, I don't like the lab. It's not for me. Um, so I think the biggest lesson in that is like, as you are thinking about different career trajectories, um, it's important. Okay, was that one better, the transition? Oh, you just muted. Wait, okay, there it goes. Um, I just got, a, I was just told that Aisha's phone is dying. Oh, okay. Uh, so she may end up dropping out. Um, so that's what, two, two rotations or are we third? That, that was two. Okay, so we still have the three more. Yeah. I'm trying to decide what we can do to get these kids to talk. I know, that's what Chris was saying too. Yeah. Um, let me see. Part of it is not getting telling them to get their questions ahead of time. Well, we did. Well, we just did it today, didn't we? Uh, yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. It doesn't give them necessarily enough time. Um, oh, good. There's a two-minute warning just popped up. Yeah. Okay, good. So that's working. Um, I think it's because we have so such little um, amounts of students. Well, but you wouldn't want any more in a breakout. That's the only thing. Um, no, I think it's just they don't, they, you know, either they don't do their homework or what, even, at the, uh, even in the resume workshop, I don't know how much participation there was, but yet we got tr tremendous feedback. Yeah, exactly. So, and I didn't make up a Google form for this one. I'm going to have to do that. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, but I'm hoping that they'll call on each person one by one. So I have not been yeah. one where, um, Let's see, I was in Jasmine's, I was in Angel's. You want to be in room five? I'm sorry? You can be in room five next if you'd like. And who's going in there? Um, that is, uh, Catherine's in there right now with uh, uh, with Abba, Mekdes, Morgan, and Sophie. And who's going to go in there next? Oh, who's going in there next? Um, that's room five. Angel's going in there. I was just with Angel, so oh, I'm that's right. Somebody else. Yeah. So, do you want to go to room two? I think because Chris is in room one, and I know he's he's got that one handled. I told him to talk, that's you know, fine. to ask questions. So I'll do two. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Hi, Deborah. Hello. Joining you guys here. Sure. Everybody talking. I hope. Yeah. There's some. There's been some good questions. We're just trying to. See if there's any other questions that these folks have before the next uh, rotation. It's going to rotate in a moment. Yep. We got a few that are interested in medical for sure. Yep. Um, that's why we wanted to introduce everybody. That's why we wanted to bring Garrett in to really, you know, talk more about manufacturing. And yet, it's in such an interesting area of transplants. So highly medical. There we go. Hello. Hello. Um, Daisy, Zamia, Charlie, please unmute yourselves and put your cameras on if you have if you have cameras. I know I know most of you do, but we do want you engaged with Allison. So hi, Daisy. Hi. Charlie, do you have a camera? And please turn your mic on. Daisy, your mic isn't on. And Zamia, your mic isn't on. Oh, Very good. I there you go. I told Laura every time when I turn on my camera, like it's black. So, but, but well, at least we can hear you. At least we can hear you. That's something. And um, good, Charlie. Thank you. And Daisy, your mic. Put your mic on. So, let's start with Zamia. Zamia, why don't you tell Allison what your kind of hopes and dreams are, and see how that fits into some of the career options in the nonprofit world. Um, so first, well, I want to go to a four-year study like biology, neuroscience, graduate my BS, and then like go to medical school, and become a medical doctor, or probably just become a researcher. Hmm. 
That's awesome. Um, that was very similar to me at your age. Um, I loved biology. I loved learning about the human body. And I went into college thinking I was pre-med. Um, and then I took my first molecular biology class, which probably you're learning at the high school level now. Um, when I started college and really started learning about um, the mechanisms of the cell and DNA and how you can make changes to gene expression to mutations and that way that that can alter the function of the cell. And I thought that was so interesting and made me want to then go on a more traditional research path. Um, and I did that through college and grad school and then kind of came to the realization that that didn't feel quite exactly what I wanted to do anymore um, after my postdoctoral fellowship. And so I was really lucky to find the job um, at the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network to be able to combine my excitement about science and certainly cancer research in particular with um, communications and being able to write and talk about some of the science in ways that is understandable and exciting to people who aren't scientists. Um, so that's kind of the path and the trajectory I took, but it was it was really reassuring to know that having this um, training in biology and really leading into what would have been a natural academic career, that there were other opportunities um, to be able to use that, use that training and education and still um, have a successful career in a different, in a different sector. Interesting. And do you have any questions, Samia, for, for Allison before I move on to somebody else? Um, no. Okay. Charlie's interesting. Charlie, tell, tell Allison about some of your thinking at this point on a career. Um, I don't know, because there's like a lot of things I'm interested in, but I have been becoming more interested in like environmental science, but also um, biology, but more towards like the biology of animals. That's awesome. Do you, yeah. Are you aware of any nonprofits that in, in that environmental or, or Jewish, at one point she said marine biology or anything with animals. Are you aware of any nonprofits in those areas? I mean, I know like the Long Beach Aquarium does a lot of education and, and um, does have foundations for um, preservation and, and understanding um, marine biology. Um, I don't know offhand of other organizations or environmental, but I know there's many and there's certainly a lot of opportunities for activism in the environmental space, um, both through nonprofits and through volunteerism, um, just because it's something that's such a critically important moment in time to be to be interested in, you know, the climate change and all that's happening and all the um, factories and and all the waste and everything. So I think it's super important. And there's also um, one of the questions I had in one of my other breakout rooms was about environmental factors and cancer. And I think there's definitely an overlap in that regard that you know, we don't fully know yet what different environmental toxins could contribute to people developing cancer. And I guess the more we pollute our air and our earth and our water, unfortunately, we're gonna kind of learn more about different ways that that impacts human health. Um, so I think there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunity in that area. Interesting, interesting. Do you have any specific questions that you'd like to ask? Well, we got you, Charlie. Um, no, I don't. Okay. And Daisy, um, you're kind of right in that field uh, with Allison. Tell, tell Allison a little bit about what you're thinking of for a potential career. Um, well, I'm interested in the medical field and um, well, more, um, more into like nursing. And, yeah. Do you want to know how that relates to the nonprofit world and her organization? Yeah. I mean, I know certainly the conversations we have with patients, um, the nurses are kind of the face-to-face -face interactions a lot of the time and being able to give information about, um, you know, nurses often have a deep level of awareness about the patient, about what they're going through, um, really day-to-day, some of the challenges and they're able to really advocate for the patient. I think they play a critically important role 
Um, we partner with some nurse navigators that really help patients understand the different treatment options that might be available to them. They can really sit down and spend a lot more time with the patient sometimes than the doctor can um, and talk about there's nurse navigators specific to clinical trials and then also just kind of general treatment options for cancer patients um, to really help go through what's called the informed consent process for, can, um, for clinical trials to make sure the patient knows what they're signing up for. Um, and we do have, have um, there's an oncology nursing society that we partner with as well. So there's definitely opportunities. Um, and I, I believe we have um, a couple of trained nurses on staff that's had a bit of a career change like I did, but um, it's definitely very applicable and very um, a very critical role to play in patient care. Yeah. And I think what's so fascinating about all of you and all of our speakers is how you do sometimes transition. You know, you think you want nursing or you want one area or another, and you find with the people around you. Remember, one of the, one of our speakers said that because of all the people around her at the mm -hmm. time, she realized there were other things of interest. So those that's how we want. That's why we're doing expanding careers because we want you all to see the variety that's out there for you. That's cool. Yeah. Any parting words for this group before you go as far as keeping their options open? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's great to, you know, you have so much opportunity with obviously the internet and being able to kind of learn about different jobs and different people you admire and different ways in which you can make a yeah, when they can make a difference. And that's a good point, the internet. We hadn't really talked about that. And here comes Catherine. Woohoo. Hi. What's up, guys? Um, Deborah, great to see you again. Let me switch to gallery view so I can see everybody. Ooh, Charles, I like your image. It's Charlie, it's female. Oh, sorry. I, oh, wow. Sorry, I'm looking at my iPad and like my eyes. I the students, Gabby is on our team. When you see Gabby, she's she's on our marketing team. But Samia and Daisy and Charlie are your audience today. All right, Samia, Daisy, and Charlie, <clears throat> hit me with what you want to know. Questions, unmute, anything. Like, you can ask me what I ate today. You can ask me something about work. It's your Have eight minutes. Have there challenges you. she may have had along the way? Samia, we're going to start with you. And Samia is, um, is having, was having a little trouble with her camera, but why don't you unmute, Samia? No, no worries. Um, so on the email that Laura sent us, um, it says that somehow you're involved with pediatrics. Can you like explain? Oh, yeah, yeah. So a lot of times you think pediatrics means you need to be a doctor and a pediatrician, you know? taking care of kids. What I do is I run a accelerator program, meaning that we are a program that invests in, incubates, and helps startups. So younger startups, uh, so they can create products that go into the market. Those products are medical devices, and the patients that those products will be used in are children. So our program is pediatric focused because the pediatric pediatrician or pediatrician slash pediatric patient is the end user of the products that we're helping develop. Yeah. And Samia, yeah. actually her mentor is your associate, Dr. Espinosa. Oh, perfect. So yeah. you yeah. He is great. Juan actually is a pediatrician and he works at CTIP uh, and we went to medical school together. Yeah. And Daisy and uh, Daisy's also interested in nursing, correct? And why don't you talk with um, the Catherine a little bit about how, you know, is there any room in, in the entrepreneurial world that you might be interested in? What questions you have about it? Or do you understand what the entrepreneur world is? Um, how does like um, marketing, um, like a new product, like um, does that account like for the medical field, like for like hospitals, new market towards like 
hospital? Or... Yeah. So I think what you're asking is how does marketing work within with with technologies for hospitals? So what you got to think about is in terms of the marketing, like who is the customer? So meaning who uses the product, but more importantly, who pays for the product? So if it's something that's like a um, a device, so a pacemaker, or you know something that'll go in your heart, or a hip replacement, or we have a device in our portfolio that is a essentially spine extender for children with scoliosis. So it grows with them and it helps straighten their back. Uh, the end customer, or the person who that gets used in, is a child. However, the customer of that product is the hospital because the hospital buys the device that the surgeon then puts in the child. So when that company markets, they need to market to the surgeons and the hospital. Because if you tell the surgeons, I have a better device that will have better outcomes for these patients, they become very interested. But then the hospitals become very interested because if there's a better product, their patients will have a better experience it may cost them less money in terms of rehospitalizations, and there are other things down the line that are beneficial to those parties. Uh, if you marketed a spine growing rod just to patients with scoliosis, they may become very excited about that, but they have no control over which device gets implanted in them because they're not the surgeon. Mm -hmm. um, I know uh, Deborah mentioned that you're interested in nursing, and, and also Deborah asked, how does nursing relate to maybe entrepreneurship? So we have a nursing innovation group that CTIP, our organization, meets with every month. We bring three of our startups to that group. And those nurses give live feedback to the founders of our companies about their devices. Like, well, we wouldn't necessarily use this in a patient because it's like hard to stick down. Or, I, you know, I don't know about this because a lot of devices are not just used by physicians. They're utilized by nurses taking care of patients and they have that, they have a lot more patient, patient facing time than physicians have. So just like we have a feedback group that's doctors that tell us about, would you use this implantable pacemaker? We have a group of nurses that gives us the same feedback. And these nurses are interested in innovation. They know how to take care of patients and they're interested in like really cool products. Mm. So even if you go into nursing, you can go into entrepreneurship in that way, whether it's giving feedback to companies or whether it's thinking of companies. We have nurses who are founders in our portfolio that they saw a problem that like they really wish they had a solution for and then they just need it. Interesting. And Charlie, why don't you tell Catherine about your area of interest and see if there's anything going on with her company there. Um. Uh, I'm more interested in environmental science and like biology of animals. So that's, that's kind of like my area of focus. Well, in terms of animals, uh, pretty much all of our, a lot of our medical device companies need to go through uh, animal clinical trials before they can go through clinical trials in humans. So they're animals somewhere, but they are earlier down the line, if that is helpful to you. And are there, would any of your companies, being that they're focused on pediatrics, would there be anything involved with environmental issues or concerns? Have you ever seen that come with, in front of you? Um, so we've seen a couple companies, for example, we have a company that makes a nebulizer, a very small device that you would use to help you breathe if you had asthma. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are certain areas of uh, the country and even Los Angeles that have uh, worse air quality than others. And so tracking how a device like that can be used amongst different populations, especially those who live in areas where the environment might be a little bit worse uh, becomes really important. So when a company like that thinks about doing clinical trials, they wanna make sure that they are looking at the environmental factors that affect these children who have asthma and making sure that they include a diverse group of children uh, to look at and to make sure that the device is effective. Interesting. Interesting. Anybody have anything else? I think we're about to change rooms. This time we didn't cut you off. <laughs> that was great. And also, hi, Gabby. I didn't ask any questions, but 
Oh, no, Gabby's with you. I don't even know. Yeah, 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 she's, so like, yeah. This was great. I'm really happy you guys are in the BioFlex program and it's been really nice to meet you. All of your questions have been very insightful and thoughtful mm -hmm. and I really wish you the best on what you're gonna do next. Thank you. Did we get through everybody? I, yes, we did. Good, 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 good. Okay, well, we're doing great on time. Um, what I would like to, uh, to finish up with is um, just if our, if our speakers, our presenters could just kind of summarize maybe one or two um, key words of advice, or if you were back in high school, what would you have done differently, if anything? And maybe why don't we start with Catherine? All right, guys, you may go first. So based on the really, really great questions that I got asked in these feedback groups, and uh, it was really interesting hearing your guys' varied levels of interest within bioscience, uh, very, very interesting. My word of advice is to think bigger than the end goal of whatever um, like education or degree you're pursuing. So whether that may be nursing or uh, science or engineering, there can be a step after that, but you may not know what that step is until you finish the first step. Uh, I'm gonna call out, uh, you know, Dr. Barry, who is an AI expert, has a PhD, and now is working, you know, at a company using her expertise, but also in a technical role. She could have gone into academia and simply teach other students how to learn about AI. That's almost the traditional path that people who get a PhD, but she did, she used that knowledge and she used it in a different way. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say a better or worse way, but she thought outside the box after she got to the end of getting that PhD or kind of terminal degree. So my advice to you guys is what you're learning now isn't the end, but don't think that you have to know what the end is right now. Thank you, thank you. Well, since your name was called out, Jasmine, I guess we have to go to you. <laughs> any, any final words or comments you'd like to make or what you would have done, would have done differently? Absolutely, well, thank you, Catherine, for um, I guess using me as that example there. Uh, so, uh, to that point, maybe a bit of advice. If I had the opportunity to go back uh, to my high school days, what I would do differently. Uh, you know, I was very studious back then. I knew that I did want to land in the, the tech space somehow, or even in the medical space somehow, and just find a way to merge them together. But one thing I would definitely do differently is I would take the initiative to learn outside of the classroom. Uh, you know, there were a variety of uh, topics and I think problems that I wanted to solve even back then. And, you know, when I was a freshman to a senior, uh, but, you know, I didn't have that motivation to, you know, take the time to learn outside of classroom and seek opportunities uh, on my own. And for you all now a days, um, you know, back then, you know, the internet was still kind of coming up and still becoming more popular, but nowadays you have the internet at your fingertips and you have all of these tutorials, you know, on programming and how to, uh, how to code, how to, you know, create your own uh, medical devices and run it through FDA regulations. You know, all of this information is out there. Most of it is free. And um, I, I guess I, I want to um, motivate you guys to consider, you know, just taking what you know, uh, continuing to learn, having that the drive to solve the problems that you are interested in. And for those people who are even undecided right now, um, as you mentioned in the in the, the breakout rooms, 
Uh, continue to explore your options. Uh, use college as an exploratory period uh, where you're learning to see what all is available out there. Uh, when I was in college, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do after I finished grad school or even what I wanted to study in grad school. Uh, but I talked to my professors. I, you know, made sure to uh, be friends with people from, uh, you know, different majors, just to get an understanding of what is all possible for me in the future. And eventually, uh, you will come across the the topic or the the field that you want to master in, and that you want to, um, you know, make a career out of. Uh, so that's something I would tell myself, my younger self, if I could go back. And, um, uh, you know, everyone has their own path. And I think for you all, you will have your own path and your own journey uh, to get where you're going to go. Uh, so uh, just be mindful of that um, and keep your options open. And I look forward to calling uh, some of you all doctor one day. <laughs> Great. A doctor or, you know, a technologist, computer scientist, um, a biologist. I, I, I look forward to seeing those titles behind your name. Thank you. Garrett, you've been around a bit. You've been in a whole different world with lots around you and big campuses physically. Any specific words or advice or, again, your younger self, what you would have, what you would say? Sure. I guess uh, I'll kind of echo and maybe say what Jasmine and Catherine kind of said, but also in a different way, I, I would encourage folks to stay curious. Um, and, you know, as, as Catherine and Jasmine said, you know, there's always a, a bigger picture and just don't lose sight of that bigger picture and don't lose sight of who you are and, and you know, your moral compass. <clears throat> because I think with curiosity and with the right focus and, you know, understanding what drives you um, every day, um, I think we'll, do far more than any other class degree, um, you know, work training class that you can take um, because it, it brings out an innate passion in you and that energy that you bring to your team um, and those around you and the people that you surround yourself with um, are only going to fuel your career and your options and your life um, even to a more fulfilling amount. Um, and I think that's one, one of the most important lessons I've learned um, over the years. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Good wisdom here. Allison, any word that you'd like to share? So yeah, definitely echoing my fellow um, panelists that your path and your trajectory don't have to be linear. Um, I you know, went to grad school and got a PhD and kind of that's training me to be a teacher, to run a lab, to be in an academic position. And it felt really scary to realize that was not what I wanted, but not be exactly certain <clears throat> what I wanted to do instead. And so I think it's important to follow your passions. And so I was very lucky to be able to combine my love um, for science and my passion about being part of the cancer research field um, with my skill and my interest in writing and communicating. And so it's important to be able something that you might do on a volunteer level or even on a personal hobby level can ultimately be something you can incorporate into your um, professional life as well. Um, and yeah, I, I at your age didn't, didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I thought medicine because that seemed like the logical thing to do as a kid who liked science, but there's many other ways um, both to, um, to become trained and educated and then to use that education and training to help solve problems um, in in the world and in, in your neighborhood, whatever you know, whatever you're excited about, um, you I'm sure will be able to make a great impact and um, and be able to do something that you're proud of. Thank you, thank you, yeah, Angel. If you could finish us off here with some words that you'd like to share. Yes. Um... I guess I'll echo a little bit of what, what everyone has touched on, but it's in a slightly different way as well. Um, one of the big things that comes to mind is teamwork. When I think about my, my current role and my current um, uh, job is, it's one of my, the favorite things that I love about doing science is I work in genomics, which is the intersection of biology, chemistry, computer science. Um, and I work with scientists that of backgrounds that I'm not very familiar with. 
And the skill that I have found the most useful is communication, to be able to express yourself in a way to um, clearly outline your intention behind what it is you want that person to understand. And um, in college, uh, I would encourage to go beyond your own field, or what you think you're interested in, and just explore, because it's very useful to understand how people communicate from different types of fields within science, um, because you get to learn so much from people uh, that have a different type of background. They each have a very valuable perspective, um, especially when you have a team coming together to solve one problem and everyone has a very different perspective, uh, either because of training or just because of our unique experiences. Um, uh, practice and uh, expose yourselves to opportunities that will allow you to just practice those communication skills. Thank you. So explore, expand, um, keep the eyes open to opportunities. Can, uh, can we go back to the gallery? I don't know if you're controlling that. Oh, here we go. Um, just give you one, one last minute. Does anybody in uh, of our students have anything they would either like to ask or say at this point? You can put it in the chat or you can, you know, just um, turn off the, turn off your unmute yourself. And I know you have plenty of time during the breakouts. Okay, I don't see anybody. Um, I would like to close this just by thanking all of you who participated, both our students, but most especially our five guest speakers. And again, to shout out to Dave Whelan, who I see is still here, um, for all of his help and support um, now, and I'm sure in the future, and to our staff as well. Uh, we will put out another evaluation like we did for the resume workshop. And I do want to tell you all that you did great on that feedback for the resume workshop. We really appreciate the comments. There were lots of excellent comments, good thought. Think about that for this one as well. We really will work with your comments. They were, as I said, they were fabulous. 